If you were going to design a city from the infrastructure up, given that we have the internet, given that we have technology, what would you do? The way we've built our cities hasn't changed much over the last hundred years. What might be possible if we built our homes the same way we built our iPhones? My guest today is Andrew Staniforth. He's leading a team of designers, engineers, and architects to completely rethink how we build our cities. There's always this inherent tension in building modularly. It's the tension between standardization and customization. And that tension is embedded in everything that we do. And coming up later, we'll visit their manufacturing facility to get a hands-on look at how their unique modular approach might lead to quicker build times and cheaper homes. Stay with us as we discuss the shortcomings of conventional construction and what it might take to reimagine how we build our cities from the ground up. There's potential for this to be huge, and there's potential for this to really address the housing crisis. The only way to solve our biggest problems is to have the audacity to try. Welcome to In the Arena with Evan Baer. So give us the high-level stats on, when you think about the space of housing, yeah. how bad of a situation are we in? It is, it's pretty bad. We, on low estimates, need about four million more units in the U.S. and on high estimates, seven to eight million units. And when you think about the tools that we have to actually deliver that, they look like the methods that we've been building housing and skyscrapers for the last hundred and even thousands of years. We have not adopted any technology to start delivering more housing. When we talk about the housing shortage in the United States, yeah. I want to uncover the, the social cost of that. Obviously, this means rents are dramatically higher yeah. from the supply and demand challenge. Um, that can mean much higher portion of your income is going to your housing. Yeah. Probably means people are living further away, longer commute times. What are some of the other reasons that that multi-million shortage number kind of weighs on you? Housing is the foundation to everyone's life, right? You think about if you did not wake up in your bed that night, right? It's gonna destabilize you and imagine that every single day, and there's a bunch of statistics on the educational performance of students that live in homeless shelters or, or experience periods of uh, temporary homelessness or instability. And really, when I think about all of the social problems that we deal with, and there's a whole bunch of them, if you could address that foundation, right? Having a place to sleep, having a place that you know that you can go back to is probably one of the most foundational things that you can do. And then everything stems on that. Um, not that one is more important or less important, but it's very much like a gating thing. If you don't have a place to sleep, a lot of the things become secondary. You mentioned that some of our construction methods haven't changed in, in quite a while. Give a little color to that. If we were to go back, say, maybe 50 years and be on the job site yeah. of building a multifamily versus the job site today, does it look exactly the same, completely different. Give us an order of magnitude here. Yeah, so the process of building, let's call it the Empire State Building, is roughly the exact same as the way we build skyscrapers today, right? You have men and women showing up on site, you have raw materials, you have steel, you have drywall showing up, and then they build it as a one-off prototype in situ. The one thing that's changed though is we have a lot more regulation around safety. We have a lot more regulation on the use of those materials. And it's slowed down the process for good reason, but it's the same process, just a lot slower, which increases cost. Set the stage for us in yeah. the founding of Assembly. Whew. So my background um, career-wise has been in large-scale development, right? Worked on uh, big arenas, big office buildings, master plans. But the first project I ever worked on was the tallest modular tower in North America, and that was with the architects, shop architects, right? They're worldwide, renowned, do amazing work. But that first project did not go perfectly well. Um, it really taught us the limit of doing high-rise modular in urban environments, right? The project stopped on the eighth floor, it rained on the inside, it really was, it was a hard project. But what we learned was the tools of building modular were very much the tools of just construction moved indoors. I always say it's like construction under a roof. And that's what we tried to do. And part of the learnings that came out of that, and Shop kept working on this for years, was 
If you're gonna do something as complex as a high-rise structure in New York City, you have to start looking at the manufacturing way of doing things. So they, they teamed up with the former CTO of Boeing and pulled in teams from Tesla and SpaceX to think about, okay, all of these other industries have increased their productivity year over year by adopting technology. What are they doing? And Assembly was born as a unit inside shop focused on bringing manufacturing thinking and mentality to the offsite manufacture of high-rise buildings. And the premise of what we're doing is instead of bringing everything to a big factory and doing construction indoors, we look at a distributed manufacturing approach. So the same way that Boeing has someone make the wings and the fuselage, we have someone that makes bathrooms, kitchens, and the structure. So the reason it's different than prefab, prefab comes, there's one manufacturer, you're kind of assembling yeah. everything offsite and you deliver it fully done. You guys have sort of designed the infrastructure essentially, the, the lattice structure that you might have multiple manufacturers of bathrooms. Exactly. And then they can just sort of pop it in. Yeah. So our role is assembly work. Our name gives it away. So if you think about the process of construction, right, typically you, Start with the superstructure, you build the structure, and then you might put the facade on, and then you might start doing the interiors. Our process allows us to parallel path. So we have people around the world making the structures while someone else is making the bathrooms, while someone else is making the walls, floors, ceilings. And then they all come together in our facility. Our first one's in New Jersey, and then we assemble it. So we take that structural chassis and plop the bathroom in, put the facade on, the walls, all of this, and then that volumetric mod then ships out and stacks on site. So that last little part looks very similar to a lot of other modular players, right? A jumbo size box shipping and stacking, but the process is very different. What, what happens in our facility is clipping. Like that's the verb, right? Clipping the walls in, clipping the facade on, clipping the bathroom in. We're not doing that construction work. What are you guys watching in terms of the lessons from COVID, the move to work from home? Is this a, a seismic change where people will really in mass leave cities yeah. or is this a little blip? I think, I think cities are gonna change. Um, I don't think people are gonna leave cities. Um, I think that we're gonna have, the use of buildings in cities has changed, right? You go from 400 million square feet of office in New York City to something less, right? What happens to those buildings? What happens to the area? What happens to the tax base that those buildings were providing? That changes. But I think people are always gonna wanna live in cities for all of the reasons that they wanted to live in cities besides their work before. Um, I think it creates a lot of opportunities to rethink what cities are and what cities should prioritize. I think the prioritization of what we care about as a society has changed over the last, let's call it three years. I think COVID was a slice of it, but I think COVID caused everyone to go home and think about just life a lot more every day. And I think that's opened up a lot of opportunities to challenge things that have been the way we've done things for hundreds of years. And I think assembly, you know, one of the reasons that I was excited uh, about the timing of what we were doing is it was coming out of a period of time where everyone was questioning, like, why do we do this the way we've done it in the past? And I think if you're challenging something as big as construction, you have to do it in a moment where everyone's a little bit more open-minded. And I think this is the exact moment where everyone is a little bit more open-minded about a lot of things in society. So when you go into a modern day apartment, yeah. are there certain things that you just get really annoyed by? Like, it's so dumb that we do this thing. Oh, um, I'll give you like a very personal example that I did not notice until assembly. I have a one bedroom apartment in New York and there is a three foot column in my living room. Just a three foot column. It's not at the window. It's like six inches off the window and it's in the corner. And like, it was so normal to me. Like just, oh yeah, there's a column. And now at assembly, I'm like, wait, what? Like, why? There is a, there's three feet by three feet, nine square feet of a column in my living room that I pay rent on. And that's just like normal, right? Because it's a flat plate concrete building and they needed that support, so they just put it there. And now at assembly, we think about everything so specifically, like our structural chassis is engineered to millimeter tolerances. We have people on our team that are focused on 
how it goes together, work instructions, the whole process, and we're questioning everything. And I'm just like, someone, when they designed my building, was like, yeah, it's okay to put a three foot, you know, diameter column in someone's apartment. Like, and those sort of things that are just like easy to uh, overlook, I think that if we're successful, one of the other things is we're gonna raise the bar on things like that. Like mm. people are gonna notice, wait, you're gonna, you want me to pay rent on this column in the middle of my living room? What? No. Um, and I think there's little things like that that we've sort of exposed by thinking about things at the rawest level. What about innovation at the level of how someone uh, lives yes. in the apartment? I mean, I think of things like yeah. what we know about um, not looking at blue light late at night, the health of standing more during your day, mm -hmm. even something like how you would design a bank out of seating to have people have time facing each other. Yeah. Can your apartments innovate in ways that shapes how we live? 100%. Um, I'd say the biggest thing that we focus on as a company is the building infrastructure that supports a lot of that. Um, so how do we create that base layer of sort of like health and safety. So how do you make sure that the air in everyone's units is, you know, safe? And we're designing right now our first buildings to passive house standards. So like well beyond um, the standards of health and safety for the buildings today. But a lot of what we do is we don't want to be super prescriptive on, you know, the banquette of seating, right? So if you think about manufacturing, you want the same of one thing as many times as possible. When it comes to housing, it's kind of the opposite of what people want. They don't want their apartment to look like their neighbors. They don't want this building to look like the building next door. And that tension is embedded in everything that we do because the easiest for a manufacturing approach is like you have this module and you just crank it out, but then it's gonna look like a shipping container building, right? We want our buildings to be indistinguishable from a classically designed, conventionally built building. So then you have this tension, like what can you have be custom and what can be standardized? Um, a lot of the stuff inside the walls is super standardized. We're really rigorous, but the stuff that you see and touch and interact with and the stuff that people see from the street, that can be fully custom. Mm. And that's how we're, we're finding that, you know, threading that needle on the customization versus standardization. But every building's a little bit different. Why have not hundreds of the smartest entrepreneurs in the world raced into this in the last few decades, given what the opportunity looks like? It is hard. It is really, really hard. Um, and I think um, the difficulty of it is um, often underestimated, right? You, there's often this idea that, oh, construction's hard. I have this outside, you know, um, outsider's mentality. I'm gonna hop in and change it. I worked in tech. And I think as soon as they get in there, they're like, oh, this is a lot more nuanced than, than previously thought. And I think that has been some of the prior attempts at fundamentally changing construction. Um, but another thing that is kind of um, embedded in all of this is the moment for radical change is just happening now, right? I think it's a confluence of the climate crisis, the confluence of the housing crisis, and then the post-COVID era where people are rethinking and being open to more ideas, which has unlocked not just the ideas, but the capital to fund these ideas, right? Construction is a business and industry based on inertia. It has a lot of inertia. It is going the way it has gone for the last hundred years. And there's a lot of stakeholders that you have to change their mind on. So our approach to that is let's do it ourselves a few times. So these first few buildings, we're acting as the builder, as the designer, and also the developer. Let's take a break from our discussion to visit Andrew and his team at their first production facility just outside of New York. This is where they'll assemble their modules prior to installation. So this is prototype alpha that we built in September of 2021. Basically, it's an extraction from a, a 15 story building that we were designing. Um, so this is a one bedroom unit. So what we're looking at right now is two mods there on the left and right. Um, so like a studio unit would be one mod. If it was a two bedroom unit, it would be three mods. So we went with the one bedroom here. So come on in. Uh, so welcome to unit 20, this is alpha. Their finished structures don't look much different than a conventionally built building. What's unique isn't what they build, but how they build. 
So our approach is all around sub-assembly manufacturing, where different manufacturers around the world make chunks of the building. So this is the structural chassis. This is an example of a bathroom. So this is a fully finished bathroom that will just slide into place. We're just clipping it together into the rest of the module. So here's the bathroom pot arriving. Um, so you can see all the electrical and wires are part of that. The kitchen arrived to us in three pieces. So you can see the kitchen going in. It has all the mechanical and the plumbing already associated to it. In terms of number of suppliers that you see interacting with all this, we had about 12 different suppliers. And all the workers that you just saw in this video putting this together, that was the assembly team doing it. The efficiency of our process really is driven by running simultaneous activities so we can have people building the foundations on site while people in our distributed manufacturing ecosystem are making bathrooms or kitchens. That allows us to run multiple parallel processes and cut down the time to build buildings by 30 to 50 percent. Reducing the time to build means reducing the cost to build. And Andrew is hoping that will lead to more affordable homes that don't need to compromise on design. The biggest challenges that we faced in creating this prototype was going from the first time from the digital environment to the physical environment and how to translate appropriately the high fidelity models that we produced into information for our suppliers used to then fabricate and manufacture from. The coordination between all their suppliers is done by creating a digital twin of their structures. The way that our model is set up is it's a parametric model, so it's very easy to update, make changes, and we can use that in the production to check against the actual physical product. With the digital twin, they're able to keep track of everything about the physical structure as each sub-assembly is being built. So this is our laser tracker, and we take it to the corners of the chassis. Station, measure, measure. We're able to then digitally compute the accuracy of everything that we put into place here. Aside from giving them a single source of accurate and up-to-date information, the digital model also lets them easily incorporate new ideas into future iterations of each structure. Treating construction more like manufacturing is something that hasn't been done before. I mean, it's been done on small scales, but to this level of detail, to be able to know that this bolt went in this location and had this torque applied to it, I think is totally revolutionizing the industry. Managing and orchestrating all these pieces, I think, is what's critical when you want to deliver a building as a product. I'm a big believer that the more modular success is, the better for the industry. Everyone is like, oh, your competitors, how do you compete? I'm like, the more people that can prove that building buildings in a new way, even if it's not our way, I think moves the industry forward from an acceptance perspective. Andrew and his team's first project is an apartment building on St. Felix Street in Brooklyn, New York. Once all of their modules are ready, it'll be assembled in a single weekend. Oh boy. So this is our beautiful hole in the ground. We're gonna put a building here in a matter of months. Super excited. Every major market needs housing. Density is key to addressing the housing crisis. So assembly is really focused on making it easier to build. How do we reduce the barrier to entry to build more housing? How do we make it less risky? How do we make it less costly? How do we do it faster? If you bring technology to this piece of the housing crisis, just start with building more housing more cheaply, that is going to make a huge dent. This is really the first proof point in showing the world that we can do this at really large scale, and this is just the beginning. If Andrew and his team succeed, this distributed modular approach could be adopted around the world, completely changing how our cities are built and ultimately making our homes more affordable. In a world where you guys are massively successful and the housing costs come down double-digit percentages in many major metro areas in the United States, what sort of fruit would you expect to see across society? Like, just think really big. Ooh. What things could happen Ooh. when people access sort of better, safer, closer to proximity quality housing? Yeah, I, I think the, I love this thought experiment. Like what happens when we're successful? Because a lot of times we're very focused on like, oh, we're gonna build housing better, faster, cheaper. But there's all of these implications that come from 
being successful. And a huge element of it is construction is really risky right now, right? There's a stat out there that says most construction projects go over by 19%. That's huge, and that's the average, right? So if you think about the risk associated with delivering construction, it means that only a certain type of person or company can actually deliver housing, right? You need a significant balance sheet, you need to be capitalized in a way that can absorb that risk. If we're able to de-risk that, it changes who can actually deliver housing, right? So right now we have a very image, like everyone has an image of what affordable housing look like or um, middle income housing. But if you actually were having the people that were living in that housing design that housing, would it be the same? I don't know. But that's one of the really interesting things that happens when you change the risk profile, change who can access the ability to build. It sort of starts rippling and changes the whole ecosystem. It reminds you a little bit when AWS came along and for startups, no longer did you yeah. need a tower of servers yeah. You could have a team that is not expert at maintaining yeah. hardware like that. Yeah. Everyone can use AWS. And it meant that you could spend time trying to solve a different set of problems. Exactly. So it's fun to think about if you guys are the AWS of housing, then all kinds of people could come to the table that probably have previously no business or expertise yeah. in designing housing. And you guys yeah. say, we'll print your house or exactly. we'll make your house or exactly. here are the core components. Yeah. Do you have any early inclinations of like what kind of, I don't know, crazy use cases could come about or what kinds of ways people might use your technology in unexpected ways? I, so the, the, the one that I think will happen, which is very um, counterintuitive when you think about modular, I think you're gonna end up with a wider variety of unit types and they're gonna be much more contextual. So when people think about modular, they think high degree of standardization, high degree of repetition. But I think with a solution like ours, you end up with a much more contextual, so this neighborhood might need much more three bedrooms, right? Or this neighborhood might need units that allow for multiple families to live together based on you know, how their cultures live in that specific neighborhood. And I think that the ability to be much more granular about what you're building is something that will happen. And it's the opposite of what people think when you think modular. Everyone thinks, you know, classic square rectilinear building with the same window over and over again. And I think if we're successful, it's the exact opposite that happens. Well, I love the idea and I catch the vision of how it lowers cost. Yeah. Also, what's really fun to think about is how it enables all kinds of new innovation following our Amazon Web Services yeah. analogy. I'm eager to see how this could go and shape education, like schools, mm -hmm. uh, healthcare, yeah. hospitality, commercial. Yeah. Where could it go in those categories? Ooh, uh, so all of those categories, except office, uh, commercial, have approached us uh, about building schools and hospitals and uh, other facilities. And I think the approach is agnostic to product type, right? Our approach of distributed manufacturing, of being that critical moment where you bring everything together and assemble it is the same if you're building a hospital or a school. Uh, the things that you might put into it might change, right? If we're doing a school, we might not be doing volumetric chassis, or maybe we're doing volumetric chassis, and when I say that, I mean the box, right? Um, we might be doing it with a lighter gauge steel because we're not going as tall. We can swap those out pretty easily, but the process stays the same. And our supply chain, we might have someone that's making walls for our high-rise multifamily uh, product, but that same supplier might make the structural components for a low-rise school. And you can sort of play this ecosystem off each other where they're building different components for different things because the approach that they employ is the same for a different product for a different building. I imagine this early launch phase, it's its hip, it's cool. You could probably price it really high because people will want to say they get to live in this thing. Talk a little bit about the future evolution of really trying to make this a more mass market accessible product. I think the, the approach that I, whenever I talk to VCs, I always start with like the, the Tesla analogy, right? The, the Roadster, the S, the, you know, you, you go down from the sort of small scale, very bespoke, very custom, very expensive to a much more mass market. And I think our approach is similar to that. We're not starting in the super luxury, but we are starting with the high rise buildings in New York, right? There, there is a limiting factor on the number of those that exist, even though there's 
quite a lot. Um, from there, I think as we build out this supply chain ecosystem, as we perfect the things that are standardized versus customized, the ability to roll this out at huge scale in different topologies from the you know, market rate unit to the affordable unit to low rise to mid rise is really unlocked once you build that foundation. Mm -hmm. One more for you about yeah. why solving this housing crisis will be a big deal. Help me understand your perspective on the importance of Americans to own a home as a source of wealth creation for their family. Yeah, yeah. So America has a beautiful relationship with housing ownership, right? It's the way that a lot of people, or most people, create wealth, right? And it's through the, primarily through the debt system that has been set up governmentally, right? Your, your mortgage is backed by Fannie and Freddie and all of these other entities that basically keep people in their homes once they buy. Um, that is a great wealth creation mechanism. Over the course of 30 years, right, you pay down your principal and then you own your home outright and you've earned all that equity. I think the continuation of that, um, I think is very American. Um, I think it has been very good to date. I think it's been exclusionary to some pockets of the population in pretty bad and dramatic ways. But if we're able to address access to that slice of the American dream, I think it could be very profound and lucrative for people. But I think there's some underlying questions of how do you actually make it accessible to everyone. So I've made all these awesome selections for this apartment. I move in, I love it. Yeah. You guys have just crushed it. There are assemblies everywhere. Now I'm gonna move to another city where there's another amazing building with assemblies in it. Like, do I put my stuff on a truck and it moves it there? Do I just pack up my personal belongings? Ooh. Like. These things don't, once they go into the building, they don't come out. No, so so right now we think about the disassembly and end of life of the building, but yep. it's not on like a turnover perspective. We Got think it. about it at like the 50, 100 years, like how does this building get dismantled? One of the nice things is when you design for assembly, by corollary, you're designing for disassembly. Like everything clipped together, it unclips, right? It bolts, it unbolts. Right. Um, but it's not at the like, your furniture slides out in some, you know, crazy way or something like that. Just give it time, you'll get there. Yeah, well, on, honestly, I, I said, like, you know, I say no to a lot of things right now, but the platform that we're building, this approach, there's so many different things that can spring up from it. Talk about getting government approvals, yeah. permits, regs to sign off on these things. That must be a mess. So when you do anything new, um, you have to test it. Um, and the first three years of our existence was prototyping and testing. We've done tons of fire tests. We've been working with specifically New York City Department of Buildings to get them into our process early and often, right? Hey, we're testing this floor wall assembly. Uh, we're gonna go send it to be fire tested. Will you review it even though we're not doing it in the building? Um, and I think that has been really, really good for our process because we've built up this catalog of pre-approved systems that can go into New York City buildings. And uh, a lot of the other jurisdictions outside of New York will be able to be uh, much faster because we have that body of approvals and testing to enter almost every other market in, in the country. And launching in New York City, I mean, that has to be one of the worst places to it, do it, this. It, so we, we chose it because it is the hardest, right? If we can do it there, we can do it anywhere. The flip side is, if this doesn't work, you can say, had we launched in Kansas, it would have worked. Yeah, but I think it's gonna work. For Assembly to really realize its vision, yeah. do you guys have to become large and influential enough to actually reshape the laws? I think for us to get the full benefit of our approach, I think there's gonna be some changes, right? And I'll give you like a very quick and easy example. New York City has height limits included in its zoning. When you build modularly, you have a floor and a ceiling, uh, and they are doubled up because you're stacking boxes, right? So our buildings, even if the units on the inside have the same ceiling height, are just a couple inches taller every single floor. If we're able to deliver buildings that are reducing embodied carbon by 40%, reducing operational carbon by 70 plus percent, but our buildings are, I don't know, 30 inches taller, 40 inches taller, like 
they're gonna make us lop off a whole floor. I don't know that any government uh, jurisdiction is gonna make that trade off. We just haven't gotten to that place where we're lob lobbying for that sort of change. But there is precedent, right? Um, the, in New York City, you're able to extend your building by an additional eight or so inches if you do high performance facades or you're able to get additional FAR if you do affordable housing, right? There's these things that are included in the code that allow you to do what the society wants you to do. And I think as we get to a place where they understand what the sort of changes because of our system need to be, I think the code will catch up. There are lots of ways that you could attack this. You could get into politics, you could reform regulation, you could start a nonprofit, you could be a journalist. There's so many different things yeah. you do. Why a startup? Ooh, um, I think it comes down to the way that things happen, specifically in this country. We are a capitalist nation, and things happen when businesses move them to the forefront. And I think we've seen it uh, in the last few years on climate, right? Climate for so long was a nice to have. And all of a sudden, it is cheaper to deploy renewables than fossil fuels. Boom, ecosystem exists, right? I think that you need those changes to the way that uh, businesses operate to make that social change. So when it comes to housing, right? If you ignore the ability to have innovation or drive innovation by saying, no, 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 the private sector can't do anything because housing is a social thing, I think you're missing a huge opportunity, right? And, and I think that all major innovation that we've seen has been driven through private sector finding a business opportunity that has both an economic success, successful outcome, as well as a social outcome. And I think that's where a business like Assembly comes in, right? I'm doing this to, to change an industry that I've been working in for over a decade. Like, mm. that's my motivation. It's not to build a company for a company's sake. I'm glad that you found entrepreneurship as a place to land with these energies. And it's really just fun to think about, uh, given how smart and talented and hungry you are to solve this huge problem, I could see you toiling away at a nonprofit for a long time and slowly raising more and more money. Or like, you're the journalist and you're writing the great expose piece and a few people read it. Or you're at like a giant developer and you're like, come on, put me in, put me in, and slowly making progress. Yeah. What's so awesome is that you get to be at the helm of this rocket ship Day one is really small rocket, it's not moving that fast. <laughs> but as you grow it, it's just this creative platform for you to bring all of your energies and recruit all this other capital of various kinds to let you just build sort of this actual rocket ship to bust through this broken industry and, and change the world. And I'm just so glad that you picked this vehicle and uh, that we get to be a small part of the conversation. Awesome, thank you so much. This has been great. I, uh, I'm excited I picked the vehicle too.